guys and welcome back to another episode of Rebuilding Wimbledon. Of course, this is the analysis video. Now, we're starting on this screen to now uh, because obviously I wanted to get a bit further forward before we actually so I could see and show you the budget. So next year's budget, 1.5 million in wages and 32 million in the bank in that sense. So, you know, not the worst. We've planned some more youth facilities and training upgrades like I have every year. Um, the border said yes, but again, like I say, it's not going to make much difference to us anytime soon, but I still want to get the training facilities up as much as I can because that will help us improve the team as well. So just looking at the actual transfers now, 308,000 in wage budget. So it's not all... Like, there potentially could be even more on that, but we're going to have to have it somewhere sort of in the middle, I sense. Uh, although possibly even more uh, down towards wages, just because, you know, some of the players we're going to have to bring in this summer could end up being quite expensive uh, because we're going to have to look in certain areas. But anyway, uh, let's take a little look at the stats first. Right, I thought we jumped straight in with the stats for the players before we get into that. I'm going to try and keep these episodes a little bit short, like I did last time, just because otherwise I find it can drag on a little bit. I don't want that. So games won and games lost aren't really hugely... Um, well, it's obviously nice if a player's won a lot of games, but you'll notice that we've, we drew quite a few games this year which is why we don't have anyone in the top uh 20 or so players on that one as for games lost we shouldn't in theory have anyone on this list either otherwise i'd be a bit worried most yellow cards planet has 14 which is the second most and perhaps his discipline could be something to look into in the summer maybe i don't know red cards though we've at least not had too many of those achabar has been sent off but we've not you know no one's actually been sent off more than once this year which is interesting man of the match awards though fabio is joint third with seven this year which is lovely to see it's good to see him up there distance covered overall is not really that important but distance covered per 90 minutes i wonder if we'd have any on there but i don't think we do uh no because of the way our tactic works generally players don't seem to do that but look at patrick roberts he covers some ground for villa my goodness average ratings we've got a few of these on here though and that's lovely to see carlos is in there as well with javi mankio isla and masek as well interestingly fabio um isn't on there which is surprising considering how well he played but i think it's because he has some off days whereas the likes of mankio isla masek particularly they just seem to turn in really solid performances every week top goal scorer is fabio 28 league goals in 31 or 32 league appearances total. He is phenomenal. Although I have to say, Jose Perez played a few less games though and scored 24 times. So he's been superb when you look at it like that. Uh, minutes per goals, Perez is right up there. But Fabio still scores more than one per game uh, in terms of his actual minutes played, which is brilliant. Shots on target percentage, Iosi Perez is right up there with us. Nothing to wonder as well. But Fabio's not bad as well. 56 pleases me there. Team goals, we, I don't know what that, I never know what that one means. I assume it's being on the pitch or something, but there we go. Penalties, this year we've not had anywhere near as many. Uh, Masek scored one. Um, that's about that, really. We've not had as many penalties this year, it would seem. Assists, Bellerin, 31 assists in 33 games is crazy. Everton with 30 in assists as well. Eisler with 11. It's good to have two players up there. That also helps. Key passes, Carlos, the second best passer in the league. And that, for me, says a lot about the way he plays because he does link up the play very, very nicely. Nine assists, not bad as well. Um, I think also not bad crossing percentage, so I'm pretty pleased with him. Pass completion, Ribeiro is up there as well, but I wasn't expecting to have any other outfield players up there just because we don't, or sometimes, I don't know, this tactic doesn't really lead to that all the time. Cross completion, I'd like to have some players on here. Isla, that's what I like to see, 22%. But look at that from Andre Silva, 29%. That is craziness. Um, I'm actually surprised Bellerin isn't on here at all, is he? Um, he must put in a lot of crosses, that's the thing. Dribbles per game, though. Look at that. Hector Bellerin, nine dribbles per game. That's mental. Everton's up there too, but look at that. Robin Masic, for someone that plays in the midfield, he doesn't half love a dribble. And that's what I like about him. He gives us more than Ramslar does in those areas by quite some time distance, but we'll see that in a sec. Osfide's not really that important, really. Team conceded, um, wow, look at that. Only 13 goals conceded in 26 appearances for Mikola de Roche. Adam Kirk, though, interestingly, 26 games. We actually aren't that bad defensively when Kirk played, but then again, a lot of that could come down to his, you know, appearances off the bench tackles per game Javi Mankio is on there I'd like to have thought that we'd have some more on there interestingly mistakes leading to goals not a single player in there that is nice to see um, because we had six of those for Brian Gomez last year and he seems to have cut that out of his game entirely mistakes overall um, Brian Gomez is in there with 81 so he still makes a fair number of mistakes as does Sam Farmer and Cresswell interestingly so that's something we could probably look at um, key tackles though Brian Gomez best in the league by eight that says a lot to me. To be 22 years old and be eight clear at the top of the key tackles list, and Planich is on there as well. That means that I, I think that Brian Gomez is he's good, but there's still some areas where I'd mm, be a little bit worried about him. Key headers, we're never normally that great here, but Gomez has still won quite a few of those as well, which is nice to see. Interceptions, Gomez again. He really does get in around these things. Now, I think he should be up there again on this one, or I'd have liked to think, because he had an... Oh, there he is, 84, so it slipped slightly from last year. Uh, conceding in terms of goalkeepers... 
Ribeiro is 45. Well, that feels like it's definitely better than last season because he's played a lot more games, of course. Clean sheets. Uh, well, Ribeiro's got himself 11 clean sheets. I don't know whether that's more or less than he got last year, but it still doesn't feel too bad. Saves held. Um, down in 15th for that one now, and I think maybe he's going to be... Mm, okay, he seems to have moved over to a sort of more saves power, but let's take a look at the team stats now. Average possession. Once again, we are the kings of possession. Um, more than 1% more than Man United on average, and mostly more than everyone else. Some teams look at that. Watford averaged 45%. Penalties? We've had three this year, and only scored one of the three penalties. Fabio has gone on pens next year, that's for sure. Uh, headers won. We were rather interested in the ratio more than anything. We're sort of mid-table on that with a 63%, which is interesting. Maybe we could get a bit better in the air. Uh, but it's interesting to see that Chelsea have got even lower. Uh, so that's interesting. Chelsea, of course, topping the one. For, but we've slipped down again. Only 77 yellow cards this year. Now, I've seen people saying, oh, you know, if you want players to win tackles, have them on get stuck in. Have you seen the number of fouls we give away? It, like, we get a luff bookings as it is. If we put them on get stuck in, we will just get red cards in every single game on top of what we've already got. You know, in terms of fouls, we're actually not... Oh, can we not sort that? Okay. Red cards, two this year, which is better than it was. Red, seven... Uh, sorry, four for West Ham. West Ham. Southampton. Form is not really important at this stage. Um, games without losing. This sort of stuff is not that important. Attacking goals-wise, fourth best. 67 goals scored. We're the fourth best team in the league for goals scored, and that's pleasing. Cross completion, we're fourth best on that one with 17. Not too bad either. Crosses, number of crosses completed. We're down in seventh on that one, which is annoying. Goals from corners, a little bit lower this year at six, which is a shame, but there you go. Goals from direct free kicks. Entire season, six goals scored from direct free kicks. Just, it's ridiculous. It just totally, look, if I go to the next league down, look at this. Like, it, it just seems to be whatever league you play in, there will be no goals scored from free kicks. Because it was I, I keep saying that, I know, but it's just it's so evident now. It's not like a one-season thing. Uh, goals from indirect free kicks. We've scored four, which isn't too bad. Pass completion, second, uh, sorry, third best in the league, even the sort of mob. But Man United are just clear on that one. Um, shots on target ratio, fifth place. But again, we're right in there too, which is nice to see. Number of shots on target in total actually isn't that far off the uh, big sides either. We need to take that little extra jump up, though. We've drawn a lot of fouls too, which is definitely helpful. We don't dribble too much. We're sort of 21 per game on average, which isn't too bad. Defending now. Conceded, we're doing eighth, which is not too bad. 45 goals conceded is, I think, better than last year. And I think we conceded over 50 last year. But um, So I want to keep trying to bridge that gap. And I want to have a season where we actually concede less goals than there are games. That's what I want from that. Conceded from corners. Uh, six this year, which is a shame because I think we've we've gone down on that one, which is a bit poor. Southampton, what Southampton are doing? My goodness, conceding from direct free kicks is not really that important because there's barely any score. Twenty clean sheets. Uh, we've got twelve clean sheets, which is not too bad, but I could do with a few more. Then again, when you actually look at it, one more and we're joint fourth, so we're actually still in and around that area. Fouls made the fourth most, but look at that. Chelsea have got nearly two hundred more. They're a dirty, dirty bunch, aren't they? Um, Suddenly could be a lot of fouls as well. But that's what I mean. Like, if we were to put Get Stuck In on as well, we'd have like 800 fouls. And we cannot afford that because we would get red cards then a lot more. Tackles won. Second best in the league. Great stuff. Penalties conceded. One. Um, which is not too bad. I think, look at that. Eight penalties Sunderland have conceded this year. Uh, attendance isn't going to be anywhere near as good this year because we're, of course, playing at the Emirates. Uh, net transfer spend, we're second on that with 80 million. Um, but again, we, you know, looking at salary per annum, still 18th. Still and that's saying so. We've come fifth this year. So above the likes of Man United, who are spending £176 million on wages, and we're spending less than a third of that. Um, still spending less than the likes of Fulham, which is it's just crazy. And yeah, it's just not going to change. I think we'll probably end up, when we eventually do get into the Champions League at some point, we'll probably still have a bottom half salary because it's going to take so long for the board to give us that money, uh, essentially. So there you go. That's the way things are looking at the moment. So I still feel like we're massively overperforming and a fifth place finish this year is still incredibly good. So let's get into the actual player stats and have a little bit of a, a look-see at them. Okay, so goalkeepers, obviously I don't have a setup here for goalkeepers. We're just going to take a look at them individually. Now, looking at the number of minutes they've actually played, um, Fraser Forster played two games worth. Hala Langura played three games worth. Ribeiro has been the man this year, but we'll take a little look at what um, Langura did in the games he did play for us. Although I don't think he actually played that much at all, but we'll take a little gander anyway. So just removing um, these... Oh, why does it always do that? Right, we'll just put uh, Premier League and Euro Cup. So... He Interestingly, it actually has a 100% save percentage, but then it's, is it really fair to even count that? But that to me says that there's definitely something good for this lad, and I think next year we do need to play him a bit more. Ribeiro, over the course of the entire season, um, 72. It feels better, but you'll notice that his saves held and saves parried is now 
a level par with each other whereas before he was holding more of them so i do think that this year i do need to try and invest some of that 32 million that we've got in a proper good goalkeeper if i can find one the issue we had last year was that all the goalkeepers that i thought looked a bit better than ribeiro were all playing for huge sides already and for us to actually pry them away would be a very very difficult scenario to do but i think we might actually have to try and sign a goalkeeper from a rival team and that is going to be a difficult task and it could end up taking up sort of like 15 20 million pounds of our budget so we'll have to be very careful on that one so that's sort of goalkeepers done already really uh moving on to defenders now center backs right then so defenders center backs the ones we're looking at this year are gomez planet anderson stoyle bonnie technically as well and even a bit of achabar but i don't really want to i don't know how many times mohammed achabar's actually played as a center back this year uh that's the wrong one it's information isn't it um so he played there three times and didn't play that well he actually played his best football when he was filling in at right back for us so that's interesting but it's just great that he can do all this sort of thing basically um he's a wonder kid apparently which is kind of cool he's a very good player he's a very good player but we'll just ignore him for now basically i'm, I'm just gonna just ir just yeah just ignore the lad for now if we can turn that off oh it doesn't do that does it um Never mind. But anyway, um, so yeah, we're going to look at Gomez, Planich, Anderson, maybe Stoll and Bonnie as well, but to a lesser extent. Gomez, Planich, and Anderson are the ones that have played the most. Um, so, goals, mistakes leading to goals. Now, as much as Anders, uh, Gomez has made three, Planich has also made three in a far smaller game span. So, to me, Brian Gomez is still doing a lot better in some respects. Um, he's scored a couple of goals as well, which has been pleasant. He's got a few man of the match awards as well. He dribbles, interestingly, more than the others, um, which I guess means he's you'd expect Planich to be better at that kind of thing but there you go tackles one is important here now he and Gomez sharing an 87 percent or 86 87 they've all got above 85 which is what I like to see that that's my key noticeable thing here 87 for Planich 86 for Gomez and 85 for Anderson all three of them are above the sweet spot of 85 I want to see someone maybe push it a little bit more and I think that over the next couple of seasons maybe Brian Gomez can get to the point where he is maybe winning 90 percent but we'll have to see how that one goes really um as for the number of tackles per game we can't really look at Bonnie now Planich is still slightly more and Gomez actually wins a few less tackles which is quite interesting to note as for passes Gomez again stands above but not by much now he's a bit more than Anderson and that's one of the things I would say I think Anderson is a good defender but when it comes to doing other things he's just a few sort of percentage points off the pace of our main partnership of Gomez and Planich who do seem to be solidifying themselves as a decent centre-back pairing at the moment and I want to try and stick with those two for now but it's useful to have Christian Boney starting to get some appearances four off the bench this year and of course Kevin Stoyle played a few games as well but again his passes were a little bit low and his tackling wasn't that fantastic either neither was Bonnie, but he did only play an hour's football so it's hard to really judge him based on that so we're not going to at this stage number of key tackles well Gomez was the best key tackling player in the entire league but Planich was up there as well these two are the kings of key tackles it really would seem like that and that's good to see um but of course key tackles means they're denying really obvious opportunities and it makes me wonder if you know they're almost last ditch tackles and that's a worry for me potentially number of shots is not really that important average rating overall Brian Gomez is the king but they're all above seven and that, that's what I like to see as long as they're above seven I'm happy games one uh now Anderson interestingly has the highest on that one 59 percent and Planet has the lowest which is again interesting so I, I do wonder about Nana Planet sometimes like I feel like he was better than this before and it seems like he's sort of fallen away a little bit and I'm not entirely sure why because it did feel like he was really offering a lot of you know potential and he just seems to have tapered off a little bit shoots with power i don't know why plays no through ball stay back at all time runs with the ball rarely okay that might be why he has less dribbles and passing and stuff like that because he doesn't actually run with the ball and we might look at some of the ppms on these players too to see if there's any kind of thing we could look at there gomez on the other hand argues with officials that is something i do need to try and get rid of and stays back at all times again but that's what i kind of want from a center back although it does mean when he's playing fullback we don't get as much forward down those wings so that's something again maybe worth looking at um headers one Brian Gomez, 85%. Again, Anderson, uh, 83 And that's the thing. Planich, only 77 uh, In the air, despite his good aerial stats, he does seem to be lacking a little bit. So I feel like we're better in the air when we've got a Gomez and Anderson partnership at the back. But we're better on the ground when it's Gomez and Planich. So that might be something to look at, actually, in terms of what type of game um, we're playing against. You know, if we want to keep it on the ground, we'll play those two. If we want to keep it in the air or we'll be defending those type of balls, then we'll do the others. Um, key headers. Gomez, I mean, look at that. 154 key headers this year that's just insane he's very very good at that not only that but he's also not bad for key passes but again that could have come from playing at right back because i think he has played there enough for that to have caused you know he's only played three times there and um nine at left back but that's a lot of performances actually put in some really stonking league of performances and he does play for france at right back too which is very interesting considering he's more of a left-sided player uh, but there you go 
Mistakes, again, he does make a few mistakes. I will give him that. But Planish makes more, I think. And they seem to look at 680 interceptions. So what I'm looking at from my back line at this point is I'm actually pretty damn pleased with them. Like, there are little areas where I think they could improve. But at the same time, I don't think bringing in another centre-back is going to be a, a reasonable or sensible suggestion at this point because i think gomez planich and anderson between them do a decent enough job and with the likes of stoyle and bonnie there as well to come in i just don't see the point in bringing in another expensive center back who's just going to push a kid like christian bonnie further down the uh, the pecking order if i get the chance i might sign a, another youngster to sort of fill in the kind of bonnie type of role to get some more squad depth but i'm certainly not going to go out and invest huge money in a center back because i really don't think that's an area that this team needs to be strengthened in anyway let's take a look at the fullbacks right so fullbacks we're basically looking at cresswell mankio Achibar, Njuku, and Bozo, I suppose, but really less so. It's more to do with... Let's just see where Achibar... How many times did he actually play at fullback this season? Um, 12 times on the right. He played about even. So, again, we can look at it, but we do have to be careful with the stats because, again, a lot of that would have been from when he was playing as a defensive mid. So, mistakes leading to goals. Cresswell, two. Uh, Mankio, one. It's it's not the worst. I would like it to maybe be one, but it's still it could be a lot worse. I'd have to say at this point. Cross completion though, so I'm very interested in my center, uh, my fullbacks. Mankio seventeen, Cresswell seventeen. That's about the team average, and our team average is pretty damn high. So that's decent. Uh, I think Mankio was more like twenty last year, so he might be falling off the pace a little bit. But I still think he's got another couple of good years. Although I will be probably looking at another left back replacement in the summer uh, to back up Aaron Cresswell this year because we've got rep we've got options on the right with the likes of Gomez can play there and Juku plays there. Bob Bozo can play there too. There's no shortage of options if we were to get injuries on that right-hand side. But that left-back spot, um, you know, Gomez has to play there or Njuku. And I don't know, I'm not entirely enthralled by that sort of area of our pitch at the moment. So looking at goal, I mean, assists, look at that. 10 assists for Aaron Cresswell. But interestingly, only one this year for Mankio. And that does say something to me. But then he has played less games, but not that many less. Cresswell does take free kicks and corners sometimes though. So that again, stat could be a little bit flawed. But again, the fact that Mankio, his cross completion has fallen as has his number of assists this year guess ball we'll, hmm, interesting it's certainly interesting he's still definitely very good at the moment i don't see him moving out of this team anytime soon because he's a very very solid player and he's still four star potential four star current ability he's 28 years old he will be playing for us for a few seasons yet do not worry about that uh pass completion now actually just look at dribbles bozo when he does play does seem to get down that a little bit more and so does mankio and i think that's an area that cresswell doesn't quite have in such abundance but down this right we are very very good and i think that might be another reason why we favor this right because the likes of mankio and bozo do seem to have this license to get down there a bit more and they're just better at dribbling but that again might be because of what's in front of them as well so there is that i do want to think you know a left back might be something to look at though tackles per game bozo yeah okay but we're more looking at these so again mankio has a higher one than cresswell by not quite i mean by sort of 0.7 which is still a lot though tackles one what I can say, though, Mankio, 85, which is good. Cresswell, only 82, but it's still above 80, so I'm, I'm relatively content with it. Um, but I think he might be just starting to decline a little bit. And I do worry. I think we need to probably bring in a backup this year and someone that can improve and then overtake maybe for the season after. Um, but 94% tackles won for Gonzalo Bozo over 255 minutes is pretty damn astonishing and I think that it's great to have him there and if we can keep him happy although you would have seen on the main menu when I was showing it earlier that he is a little bit upset about that so if we can keep Gonzalo Bozo happy next year he could definitely be very very useful in those senses uh, average rating again he's played well in the games he's played but all the players that I want to play well have done in those positions so I'm, I'm happy with that games one Bozo again does well in those games Cresswell 56 Mankio 53 um I think it's the lowest, but again, it's still above 50%, so that I'm okay with it. Headers one, not really hugely important for my fullbacks, but Cresswell, again, 64% is not too bad. Mankio, a little bit lower, but he's not as good in the air as Cresswell. One of the things I liked about Cresswell is he is good in the air. Um, key headers, again, we're ignoring Brian Gomez at this point, but Mankio, 21. Interestingly, he wins more key headers, but less percentages of the headers, so he's, it's, it's an interesting stat if nothing else. Key passes, though. Mankio and Cresswell both have over 100. In fact, Mankio over 150, and that says a lot to me about what, how important fullbacks are in this team. Uh, I think some of the most important players in this team are our fullbacks. They really do provide a lot, and we need to have the best ones we can. Uh, I don't think we do just yet, but we will, I hope, anyway. Mistakes? Cresswell made more mistakes, but he's played more games. You feel like they'd probably be about the same if they were to play if they would have played the same number of games. Passes completed. Again, it's very, very, very tight between all of those three players. And that's what I like to see. And that's what makes me think that Bozo could fit in there nicely when he does get a chance to play because he's he's pretty much matched them stat for stat in the games he has played. And that 
that to me says a lot. And I think on the right-hand side, we are good. Left-hand side, though, is an area where I'm definitely going to look for a sort of player with a decent level of ability currently, maybe, but also lots of potential if we can find one that's got five. I think I did see one in my scout report a couple of months ago. Um... I may have to send some scouts out. It's going to be more difficult in the summer because, of course, with the World Cup and the USA stuff going on, it's going to be more difficult for me to find players because I'm going to have to keep going back and forth and I can't concentrate in the way that I would normally do. But I think that left-hand side is an area where we do need to look. You know, admittedly, actually, I was supposed to be that, but he tended to be more of a utility player uh, because I, I looked at his stats and he can play there well, but he's just so much better elsewhere. So I think we need a, a dedicated left-back replacement this year. That's my first sort of big signing idea, and maybe a goalkeeper too, as we said. Right, now let's take a little look at... Um, well, let's go for the centre mids first. Right, so midfielders in the centre. Now, of course, this encompasses the attacking mids and the um, defensive mids too. So it's, it's not all the same. Now, interesting here, Carlos, straight off the bat, we noticed that he has got himself two mistakes leading to goals, which is a shame. Um, Ramslar with none, which is nice to see, although he's injured at the moment too. So that there's that. Uh, Masek with one. But I I'm pretty pleased with Masek. He's played more game time this year than Bart Ramslar. Um, now, he hasn't... This is a bit of a misleading stat. He, I don't think he's put in many crosses this year. I remember one which did score us a goal. Um, so there is that. But I just think that perhaps that's that's an ignorable stat because their centre mids, they rarely ever get to play out wide. So I'm not really that bothered about that. Goals, though, from these centre mids. Carlos has got himself a few. Baltam has played in there as well, but most of his performance has been out wide. Farmer's got a few goals and a few assists, but it's great to see him contributing, even though that's not part of his game. Masek's got himself two goals and five assists playing in the centre, which is considerably more than Bart Ramsalar, despite playing well he's played a little bit more than him but Ramslar only has um he's got four assists but no goals this year at all uh so I think Masek next year could end up being our starter in that role and part of me's even tempted to move Ramslar on because we get a lot of money for him at this point and we could maybe reinvest that in a backup for Masek rather than having a player that's going to get angry so it might be something I'd be tempted to do is to move Ramslar on and bring in someone new in that position because we could probably get a lot of money for him at this point Dribbles per game, Masek is the king of that. Despite playing a bit deeper, he really does love a dribble, but that is because he does have um, these sort of, look, gets forward whenever possible, and I think that allows him to do that, but he does have decent dribbling of 12, and he's just got decent stats all around, to be honest. Likes to switch ball to the other flank, and that's the thing I think that um, Ramslar doesn't have. Gets forward whenever possible. Oh, no, he does. Okay. Refrains from taking long shots. Gets forward whenever possible. They both have that. Um, maybe could do with getting Masek a new PPM like the 1-2-1 one, one that Ramsalot has. But the thing is, the reason I think this tactic works with both of them is because they do like to switch the ball. So we can put the ball into them and they will switch it to both flanks with these long passes, even on a short passing strategy. And I like that about them. I do. Pass completion in the midfield. Sam Farmer with 80. Ramsalot with 80. Masek with 80. All three of them have hit that sweet spot, which is what I like to see. Carlo isn't far behind. Carlos is much, much lower, which is interesting, but it might just be because he's playing further forward. If you notice, Fabio and Shane Williams all have much lower pass completion because they generally get to play slightly further up where they maybe have to play more difficult passes because he does play a lot of key passes so I can sort of accept it as long as it's above 70 uh, so Fabio but then again he's played more up top anyway tackles one Sam Farmer 89% tackle completion S astonishingly good he's one off the absolute like magnum opus of tackling for me uh, if you get 90% you're just done for me Achebar's done well Masak again though Apologies, there's a fire alarm going off next door, I think. Right, where was I? Sorry about that. I had to stop recording because it was just getting fucking irritating. So, tackles, yeah. So, Masek is again on 81. So, um, Ramsalar, you notice how much lower he is on tackles one. And that, that, to me, is one of the reasons why I love having Roman Masek in that team. Because he wins that ball in the midfield so much more often than um, Bart Ramsalar. Only one more key tackle, admittedly. But that 81% is what I want from that midfielder. You know, he's got decent passing, decent tackling, decent everything. Roman Masek is sort of, he's a complete player he does all the right things in the right way and it's great uh, as for his shooting it's not even that bad 39 percent shot on target is not bad for a player like that and as you'll notice he's got the best average rating of anyone in this team in the middle and that says a lot about him for me as well uh he covers a lot of distance too for a midfield only slightly more than ramsalar to be fair but that extra one over the whole season is probably quite a fair bit uh we don't do too badly in terms of winning games with him in the team either 58 percent compared to ramsalar's 47 percent so again to me it really does suggests that Roma Masek is the man for that middle. I just feel like Ramsalar is slightly getting left behind by the team now, despite how well he's done. I feel like probably, you know, probably maybe not moving on or something. I don't know. It depends on what I can see elsewhere, really, because I... We only do play one in the middle, and we'd need an understudy, but having two of them that can both play there equally well might just be better for squad depth. If I can convince Bart Ramslar, because he's never complained, to stay in there as maybe as a sort of backup, then I think maybe that's a better option, actually, than moving him on, to be honest. Headers one. 
Well, Rumslav does win a few more headers. He's 69% of his headers are won, and Masek is only on 53. But again, it's still above 50, which is what I want from those midfielders, um, because it's not super important that they're winning loads of headers in that midfield, because generally they get the ball to their feet anyway. Uh, number of key headers. Uh, let's see. Well, Carlos has five, Ramslar four, and Masek again two, which is fair enough. Now, key pass is an interesting one for me, because again, Masek 178 compared to Ramslar with 199. Now, I feel like he, if you averaged it out, if they were both to play the same number of games, Masek would still have made more, which to me is, again, a good thing. Although, no, actually, I think that's probably about fair. Uh, Ramslar's played 2,000 minutes, Masek 2,600. So I'd say that 178 passes key in that time is very, very good. Fabio's up there too, as is Farmer, which is nice to see. And um, not only that, but something that really does please me is the number of mistakes that Masek makes. Only 41 mistakes from 45 appearances on the pitch, whereas Ramslar with 36. And that that's important to notice. Sam Farmer's made 108, but then he's still young and he does do a lot of good work in that position, to be fair. And he's not made any mistakes that actually led to a goal. So they've all been sort of niggly mistakes here and there, which is nice to see. Passes completed. Masek again. 61.7 per game is superb. And he's also not bad with the old interceptions as well. He's better again than Ramsla. Um and again probably still better so I just think Ramsla is he's the second choice now Masek is going to be starting pretty much every match for us next year I sense but again it means that we've got great rotation options because of Bart Ramsla. so I'm not entirely that bothered about it so again in the midfield I'm actually very happy with our sentiments we've got decent players I maybe will look for a shadow striker type of player though I'm not entirely sure or maybe just drop Fabio back and look for another striker. I have not really decided how I'm going to handle that situation yet, but I'm sure I'll come up with something. It depends on what's available, basically. I'll look for both, but if we can't find a decent striker, then instead I'll look for a decent shadow striker and vice versa, because we'll try to find, at least surely we'll be able to find one of them, you'd think. But let's try and look at the wingers now. This is a key one for me. So, wingers. Now, as for wingers this year, we're really only looking at Everton, Eisler, Baltam, and a little bit, to a certain extent, Carno, but not really. We're more looking at Everton, Eisler, and Baltam, uh, because that's where they've predominantly played so things that are important to note so far cross completion Eisler 20% cross completion Everton only 14 but he does get a lot of assists but it means that Eisler I think over a full season will probably if they can both play the same number of minutes will probably get more assists next year and it'll give us options down both wings which is pleasing now you'll notice that Imran Baltam only 2% and that's because he's so poor there and I think that when he does play he has to be an inside forward we, we cannot rely on him crossing the ball he's got to be um, a different type of player when he does play there now I'm obviously retraining him to play him through the middle and once he's fluid there we'll probably be able to deploy him there a bit more and then we can maybe start to look for wing backups because we're a little bit thin on the wing still so i might start looking for some more youngsters um just to try and fill left and right wing spots maybe we can find someone that can play on both sides just as a youngster that can come in and play because the fact is even if they're not brilliant they'll get plenty of game time when everton and Iceland need to have a little rest so i think that's something worth looking into goals wise Iceland got seven everton got six 50 games for Everton this year. Brilliant stuff. Seven goals for Imran Baltam as well. Says a lot to me about what his use is. And I think inside forward is very, very useful for him because he's not going to create a lot, but he is going to score. And I think that's key for us. Assist-wise, Everton is the king. But... I feel like Eisler could have maybe got close to that over a full season. And he got more Man of the Match awards too. Everton is a better dribbler. That much I will say. But Eisler still isn't too bad. And that's always fine with me. Pass completion though. Everton 78. Um, Baltam and Eisler 73. Again, it's still above 70, which is fine. But it's nice to see Everton actually does link up that play very, very well down those wings. Tackling wise, Baltam. You can see what I mean about how he's just a better tackler um, than a lot of players in this team. But Eisler, despite having decent tackling stats, as far as I remember, he's got decent tackling. Um, no, he's got seven. Apologies. It was Imran Baltam that's got the decent tackling. That would make sense, but he's not done badly. And I think with a decent player behind him, he does well enough. Tackling, um, as for the percentages, 68, 60, and 56. It's not too bad. It's still above 50, but it's nice to see Baltam's being as high as that. Definitely looking like an inside forward type of player. And I think that's going to be his role in the team next season when he does play. Although I might deploy him through the middle at times as well, because I think he can do a lot from those positions, as you can see from his decent uh, shooting stats, as is Eisler. He's done well there. Average rating, Eisler actually had a slightly better one. And Baltam, he's still got above seven, which is fine by me. Games one, Baltam again is right up there. Eisler and Everton, again, it's just over 50% for Eisler, uh, which is a little bit interesting, that's for sure. But again, Baltam, but he has played a lot of the time against weaker sides. So mm, it's not entirely sure if we can take that into account. Eisler, 65% headers won. Again, they're all above 50, but 65 is very, very nice. A decent number of key headers. Baltam with less key headers, but then less game time. Key passes, now they should be about right. Eisler with 137, Everton with 189. I kind of feel like over the full season, Eisler would probably have got very close to that. Uh, Baltan with 57, 
could do with a few more but again if he's an inside forward maybe less so mistakes wise it's the same order basically and i feel like that's about right again they'd probably average out to about the same passes completed per 90 minutes now interesting they're all the lower ones on that but it's because the likes of cardo ramsla have generally played more towards the middle anyway bell time is a little bit lower but the other two are fairly close to each other in that sense and a few more interceptions for everton so as for these wingers i'm happy with the isla everton partnership those two i think could be our wingers on the right and left for years to come bell time there as a backup but i think we could do with another player uh that can play maybe both sides if we can but if not then definitely the right hand side as their favored side to be a backup to everton this year because as much as he's been solid this year i do worry about him getting injured because i feel like if we were to lose him down that wing we really would be in shit and we cannot afford that so i think a left side uh, sorry a right sided player that can in theory play both wings would be very very important to us right about now so that's probably one to add to the list and we're finally going to take a little look at strikers now as for strikers this year now we've had four players that have basically played some minutes for us but we're going to try and sort of ignore colin murphy because he's, he's not had enough chance to play he's barely played and he's been out on loan and done a good job but i just feel like his time at the club i don't know i feel like he's never really going to reach the level that we want him to which is a shame but he's played a decent number of games for us and scored a decent number of goals but not that many um but but there you go that's just how it is really with him um so we're going to take a little look at no goals uh, no mistakes leading to goals which is good to see cross completion again it's not really relevant for strikers because they very rarely find themselves in those positions adam kirk he's only started 11 games but he has scored 12 times and that's still not a bad return for a player that is essentially a bit part player in this team he's got goals in his game but i just think he needs to be a little bit more consistent and i'm hoping he can get to that point but i am worried about his ability to do so and i think that he might be our first sort of i know bad signing no plays no through balls short simple passes likes to beat the offside trap he's got all the sort of markings for me of a solid player i just i'm just not entirely sure about him at the moment I'm, I'm still on the fence he's got some goals for us but i'd like to see a few more but it is difficult when we're only playing one striker at the moment um but that does mean we can thin the herd a little bit Mateus scored one goal that, that is literally all he did and he's not pleased at the moment because of that but i don't know I, I think he might be one of those players that yeah okay given the right chance we could have maybe got something out of him i do worry about his ability to actually stay at this club because i think someone might put a bid in or something and i, I can't get him on a new deal at the moment which is annoying dribbles per game fabio is the king of dribbles as we know he goes past people like they're not there tackles murphy still does well with his old tackles but the fact is fabio's up there as well tackles one again kirk and fabio both have over 50 percent now that's what i like to see from a striker they need to be hunting players down and putting tackles in shots on target Adam Kirk does have a very good ratio to shots on target at 66%, which is good. I think he's just getting too many of his shots saved. You know, it's like only a 6.84 over the full season. And I think that's a lot of very poor substitute appearances from him and a little bit of a worry on my part um, about him. But I still feel like he's definitely our second best striker. But I would look in the summer to maybe bring in a third striker that could maybe go in between them in terms of their pecking order position. But we'll, ne we'll you never know. Headers one, uh, 44 for Fabio. He's just better in the air. Adam Kirk just isn't that good in the air. But Fabio is just a good all-round player. Look at those key headers. The key passes as well say a lot. A few more mistakes. Makes a lot more passes, though, per game. That's something I will say. And makes a lot more interceptions. But again, some of that could be because he's played a little bit deeper. He's had a really stonking season this year, Fabio. 33 goals is very, very good. And I want to see the same sort of level of performance out of him next year. I just worry about our ability to put the ball in the net. So that kind of brings it to an end here. Um, because... I think what we're looking at in the summer is definitely a left back replacement, definitely a right back backup, and maybe another striker or attacking mid, but also perhaps a goalkeeper. I think that's an area that we really do need to look at properly, is to try and get a properly decent goalkeeper uh, if money is no object, so to speak. Uh, but it's going to be difficult. So we've got a little bit less money this year, but I do have a horrible feeling that we might end up losing one of our best players this summer. But getting fifth should hopefully help with that. But I do worry about the big clubs circling for the likes of Fabio and Farmer and Carlos and Everton and Eisler and most of these guys so we're going to have to do our best to keep hold of them obviously i'm not going to sell them if i can't if i can avoid it but you never know what can happen with these things a lot of them i don't think there's any decent release clauses in them anymore but the board might go over my head the players might cause all kinds of upsets but so it could be a very very um tempestuous summer you just never know so hopefully this has been you know as uh informative as it always is i i you know i know that not a lot of you actually well some of you watch these and i'm glad that you do i'm gonna keep doing them anyway because it gives me a chance to think out loud and i could do with that sort of thing anyway so if you have enjoyed it of course drop a like on it that would be spectacular and so yeah join me tomorrow for some transfer goodies with Wimbledon. And thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.